Hello everybody, it's Dr. Heather Hammerstedt from Holist and welcome back. It is a Wellness Wednesday today and I have Dr. Leah Houston here from New York City. She's a board certified emergency physician just like me. She also has a specialization in precision, precision medicine. Um, she was in private, she was uh, working as emergency medicine for a long time and she is now in private practice because she got out because of the re regulatory and other issues that she felt we're hindering patient care. So she is here today to talk to us about a way to revolutionize our healthcare system, both for patients and for doctors. And so why is this a uh, an interview that I wanted to do on a Wellness Wednesday? Well, there's a couple of reasons. Um, first of all, you guys already always know that I like to talk about how we've lost control of our healthcare system and about how the patient and the doctor are no longer um, together at the center of this healthcare system, that we have just layers and layers and layers and layers um, of people in between us. And that's really what is not just driving costs, but also driving physician burnout and um, driving the lack of uh, good patient outcomes. And I think this is a huge issue for both of us to really understand. So um, let's see, let's talk about this. So um, I like to talk about how um, in Holist, what I think is revolutionary is to use teams of practitioners and uh, physicians to, um, to, um, to focus on the patient itself as a team-centered, um, patient-centered approach without the insurance companies, without you know the layers of administrators. And I think that's revolutionary. Well, Dr. Houston, she is really the revolutionary. She is here to talk to us about blockchain technology, which I'm sure you've heard about, like Bitcoin, right? <laughs> but she's actually um, talking about doing this in healthcare. And let me just read a little bit to you about what she introduced to me while we're waiting for her to figure out how to find me. <laughs> so um, it says that HPEC, which is her, um, her company, hey, there she is. I'm going to add her on. Um, it will lever leverage blockchain um, distributed ledger technology in order to alleviate the validation and authentication problems that plague the current healthcare system, while also providing a vector for physicians to regain their autonomy. And this will hopefully be improving outcomes and decreasing cost by dramatically reducing administrative costs and unnecessary payments. And so it sounds really kind of crazy and big and it really is and as soon as she gets on here it says adding 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 <laughs> as soon as we get her on here we'll hear a little bit more about what blockchain is um, beyond kind of the bitcoin that we always hear about what makes her project so exciting for physicians but also for um, for doctors um, and kind of what the barriers for uh, for adaptation are and so um, let's see it says that she is still adding. Um, so let's talk a little bit while we're waiting for her about kind of the bigger picture of Holist and why I think a lot of this is all really good for it to come together um, is that um, I'm adding you again. Um, is uh, So Holist is looking to do an, a virtual integrative care company. So pulling, hi. Hey, how are you? Awesome. I figured it out. That wasn't so bad. Yeah. That wasn't so bad. <laughs> good. Well, welcome. I was just introducing you a bit and talking about, you know, why I'm really excited about having on here. You know, here at Holist, we are working on revolutionizing our little portion of the world of bringing, you know, practitioners from alternative and conventional um, fields of health and wellness together and team focused right on the patient without all those barriers of care using telehealth and, you know, really kind of getting together and figuring out how we can do this all together. And you are kind of on the kind of business portion of all of this in terms of figuring out how we can really improve not just physician lives, which is obviously a big thing for us, uh, but also figuring out how we can provide better cost effective care and better, um, you know, better improved outcomes for our patients. And so welcome from New York. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to, yeah. to chat with everybody. Yeah, so um, so I, I talked a little bit about, you know, who you are and um, what HPEC is. Give me a little bit of kind of your story about how you got from, you know, emergency medicine like me um, to, um, to where you are today as founder and president of HPEC. So, you know, we all went to medical school for our own reasons, but usually it had to do with the fact that we wanted to do something that uh, was challenging but also helped people. Uh, where we could yep. you know, connect with people and use our skills. Um, and the thing is, is 
I wanted to do that too. And I did that for almost 10 years. And in that process, you know, I kind of had this weird feeling that something's wrong here. Something's wrong with how this is happening. I feel like I'm tethered to the health system. I feel that uh, my autonomy is kind of being stripped and um, something happened where the, uh, my identity was stolen from a hospital, by a hospital. Mm-hmm. Um, and they were using my professional PTAN number to bill for charts under, you know, for patients that I had never seen. And long story wow. short, this led me to lose my job for five months. It was a mistake. They eventually admitted their mistake. They reversed everything. Everything was fixed, but I wiped my savings out. And during that time, I realized how many physicians had had something like that happen. Not necessarily have their identity stolen, but have their professional brand uh, tarnished somehow because of really a mistake in either the system or the way the system manages uh, physicians. And, um, you know, I've always been an investor. And so I, I was an investor in cryptocurrency and I was reading about blockchain And I was learning about digital identities and I was learning a lot about healthcare solutions that are giving patients their digital identities, attaching them to their medical records. And because all this stuff had happened to me, I said, well, you know, in order for that system to work, doctors also have to have their identities. And um, so I came up with this, this idea that will give physicians a digital identity that's self-sovereign, that they control, that's not controlled by health systems or other third parties where they can then move freely in uh, the open healthcare marketplace that they create, interacting with their patients untethered. Yeah, so it's really, it's like a great example of, um, of walking through the door when the door is open for you, right? Yes. Like, I don't, I don't believe necessarily in, you know, things happen for a reason, but like, that was a terrible experience you went through. And guess what? Like, the door became open for something that's really fascinating and hopefully will really help all of us. Hi, Dr. Sanson, Dr. Mel, thanks for watching. Um, so talk to us a little bit about, you know, what is <clears throat> blockchain? So we hear about it all the time and we don't hear about it all the time, but we're hearing about it more and more and more. Of course, you hear about Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies that you alluded to, but, you know, tell us kind of basically what that technology is and, w- and, then, um, and then we can get in a little bit about how we can use it for healthcare. So I like to compare blockchain to the internet, the term, the internet. It's a, it's a, it's a global term, the interweb. The interweb. Yes. <laughs> you know, so this is a technology that really didn't even come out to the nineties. World Wide web was invented in 1991. Didn't become mainstream. Didn't be, didn't become adopted in households until early two thousands. 50% of households yeah. had the internet. So it took 10 years Um, But now it's woven through the fabric of our lives. Without the internet, we can't do anything. Most of us do our banking online, do our communication online. Social media has basically taken over the advertising industry. And so it's it's a horizontally applied um, application. And similarly, blockchain will also be a horizontally applied application, Um, meaning it's going to touch the daily fabric of our lives in the next 10 to 15 years. And the reason is because it provides two things that we currently don't have and something and two things that the internet cannot provide. The first one is an immutable ledger of transactions. And when I say immutable, I mean, nobody can alter it. Once it's there, it's there. So unlike a bank where they can erase a transaction um, or erase your entire, you know, account or freeze your entire account because the government told them to. And unlike Facebook or Twitter where they can mute your posts, um, that right. can't happen because these transactions are peer to peer. And then the other thing that it provides is disintermediation, uh, which, you know, they're kind of overlapping, but disintermediation from the need for a trusted third party. Um, okay. So in <clears throat> the case of, you know, Twitter and Facebook, they still own our data and our ability to communicate. You know, I have a friend that has a million followers and he posts things and most of the followers don't see what he posts. He's tried to find out if Facebook will allow him to pay to make sure that everybody gets his posts. And that's just not something they're able to do or willing to do um, as part of their service. Um, So in the case of healthcare, the reason this is important is because we as physicians have lots of data that's really important and it needs to be protected. Our Medicare, Medicaid provider numbers, our NPI numbers, um, our professional licensing certificates, you know, there's doctors that have tried to pretend, people that have tried to pretend to be doctors. 
our credentialing. So if we had an immutable ledger of our credentials, no longer would we need this two, three, four month process of paperwork just to be able to move to another hospital or work in another health system. We could just, we have it. We'd have yeah. it instantaneous, yep. owned by us, mm -hmm. portable. Um, mm -hmm. And it would also allow for, in my opinion, one of the more important things is disintermediation from the need for third parties in general. So third party administrators are, you know, all over our system, uh, interrupting and disrupting the doctor patient relationship. And when I'm talking about third party administrators, it's health systems in general, it's insurance companies, pharmacy benefit managers, um, other, yeah. you know, you know, people who are trying to uh, assist us in our practice and uh, make our practice life easier, like advertising firms like ZocDoc, things like that. Those are all third parties that may right. not be needed if we properly implement this technology in the future. So when mm. I think, so I, I, I'm novice to this, but I obviously knowing that you're coming on, um, reading more about it. And it seems to me like what it is, is I'm imagining um, one transaction and then the transaction is kind of loaded into a bigger box. And that bigger box is a bigger box is within a bigger box of millions of other boxes, right? And it's a technology that's out there, but they're all interconnected in a way. We own our own section, but we're connected to everyone right. else. Right. And that's the thing that's really powerful <clears throat> because, you know... Oh, we have a question real okay, quick. Great. We have um, Joshua Gabriel wants to know, would blockchain keep patient information private? Well, so what's beautiful about blockchain is that it's distributed. So right now, um, it, yes, it can keep patient's information private. And the way it would happen is if you attach information to a hash function that's on the blockchain and you keep that private information um, in a separate space. And then you can also, you can de-identify or pseudo anonymize that data. So if you want to share it for some reason, it's not attached to your name. You're only sharing data that needs to be shared. You can do something called federate the data. Um, and so a lot of these things that, have to- From a research perspective is really- Really yeah, so research yeah. and development is a really, really good and interesting use case for, for a blockchain, and a lot of people are, are looking into it. Yeah. So besides, um, besides physician credentialing in our own autonomy, I mean, I can see how that is going to drastically cut costs just right there for the number of human resources yes. and the number of built-in processes that we don't need for that portion of it. But how else do you see it affecting our ability to directly care for our patients or for our patients to be able to get, you know, not just less cost, but more uh, better patient outcomes by using something that's distributed like this? Well, so why does anything you, anybody use anything? Why do we use a dollar? Because we all agree that it has value and because we go to the store and we're able to get something for it. Why do, mm -hmm. why do patients use insurance? They use insurance because they can get something for it or they have the illusion that they can get something for it. Um, yeah, and, it's an illusion. Right, exactly. <laughs> In a lot of cases it is. And unfortunately, they don't find out it's an illusion until it's too late. They have cancer at stage four and they yeah. can't, you know, nobody ever finds out because they, nobody's going to be, you know, spending time warning the American public about this when they're sick and dying. Um, right. But, you know, so I, I agree that to a certain extent, uh, insurance is an illusion. So if we as physicians are all in one space where we can collaborate and convene on policies, but still also practice independently, untethered from health systems, then we essentially create a free open marketplace uh, powered by the collective physician consensus. So if a patient has insurance and they can either pay eight thousand dollars a year for their insurance and have a seven thousand dollar deductible or they can go directly to the network pay a physician directly and then have some kind of maybe catastrophic plan that they choose to to purchase right. and they find that that's cheaper to go to our decentralized physician database for care then they'll stop using insurance if um, employment models, you know, Google, for example, spent $881 million on health insurance for their employees last year. Imagine if even a fraction of that, say 20 or 30 percent, went directly to doctors on this network. Um, that would, I mean, that would cut the administrative costs of everything. It would eliminate the 30 percent 
uh, you know, waste. There's $700 billion of wasted healthcare dollars every year. Um, so a lot of these things are potential solutions, but they're only solutions if physicians decide to utilize right. this technology. Do it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, I mean, I can really see, um, you know, big connections with um, uh, needing legislation to remove, you know, state licensure so that we can practice nationwide. I see big connections with telehealth, right? You know, all these, yes. the, all these things that are developing um, and the ability to kind of unify us in a way as a physician voice is something that I'm really passionate about. You know, we, we're, we're so in the weeds on taking care of patients um, that we have just kind of put our heads down and thought, well, someone else will take care of the health system. And guess what they did, right? They walked away with it. Yes. And the patients are suffering and we're suffering for yes. it. The insurance companies don't want to invest in preventative care. One of the other things I do is lifestyle medicine, which is obviously coaching for behavioral mm -hmm. change. And they don't want to invest in that. The hospital systems don't want to invest in that right. because they don't want to, you know, what, well, there's no money in that. And literally, I was told that by a system executive, right. there's no money in that. So we don't want to prevent 90% of the disease that we could with lifestyle change. They also want to keep all that money for their shareholders, right? So if there's an opportunity to pull all these things together, right? Telehealth, lifestyle medicine, you know, you know, um, blockchain technology, like there's a lot of really amazing stuff going on, but it's like having to get out of the silo of this is my business and this is my business yes. and like pulling us together to create, you know, a network like that. It's really exciting. So tell us a little bit about HPEC, what it stands for, um, why you think that your, your idea for implementing something like blockchain is unique from the way that other people are talking about doing it. So um, first, I just want to go back to what you were talking about. There's no money in it. Yeah. Um, yeah. I want to remind everybody who's listening right now that we as physicians control 80% of the healthcare spending. So if we're talking about $3.9 trillion, which is the estimated cost of healthcare for this year, that's $3.1 trillion that we control. With the stroke of a doctor's pen, you need, you need that in order to get a CAT scan, to get admitted, to get surgery. And so they've found a way to control us in order to control that right. spending. And so um, when an administrator says that it's not worth it and there's no money in that, um, well, their job will be obsolete soon. Um, when this new technology starts being implemented and people start gaining control of their employment rights and things like that. And when patients are also start con gaining control of their data. So um, I just wanted to kind of remind people of that. I think doctors have forgotten yeah. how powerful we are. Yeah. Well, I, and, and as an addition to that, um, we control 80% of this, of the spending around us because of our decision making. Yes. But I also want to make the point that we as physicians are only 7% of the, of, of the actual right. healthcare spending, our professional fees, right? And so people get confused about that. So I want to be clear that like 80% is not paying my mortgage, right? It's like 80% is paying for the care that our physicians, uh, that we're writing for or deciding for our patients. Right. But our actual fees are this, this Not this even much. just our yeah. fees. Our fees go to the hospital. Yeah. They don't go to us directly either. Um, and so three times the amount that physicians are paid is wasted on administrative nonsense. So, um, and a lot of this can be fixed with this technology. Um, but going back to your question, you know, so there's a lot of solutions in healthcare that people are trying to apply uh, blockchain to. And sometimes they're looking for, it's a solution looking for a problem. And sometimes um, there's no problem to be found. And a lot of people yeah. say, oh, patients are gonna own their own healthcare records and everybody wants to own their own data. And the truth of the matter is there are, there's a small subset of the population that does wanna do that. They're um, also the same ones who are also very good at taking care of themselves already. Uh, the yeah. people who we see in the emergency department who have been marginalized in society, who have severe mental illness, drug addiction, they don't care about their data. They don't care about their records. And my argument is that we as physicians have always been uh, the best advocates for our patients, especially in those situations. And so when it comes time to advocate um, uh, and help others be custodians of their own health care and their own data, you know, we're the ones that are going to need to step up because if we allow the health systems and insurance companies to continue to do that and take that role on, then our patients are going to continue to be exploited. And so are we. Um, yeah. So um, 
of the 198 white papers in blockchain, um, there are really only a few solutions in the healthcare industry. And uh, provider data and physician data is, is one big one. And there are some industry insiders who agree with me on that one. And that's why I've been asked to speak at CIS and a couple of other conferences in blockchain coming up um, because they see that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so what do you think, like if you envision in the future, like what do you think, hey, if this is, if, if you know, 15 years from now and this is like everywhere and, and this is how things are working, what, what are patients going to feel the differences in terms of how they relate with their, what their outcomes are and, and what, how they relate with their physicians? Well, I think that patients are going to feel that doctors are now able to care for them instead of rush through the visit and spend all their time on data entry. Right now, they, they yeah. feel that we're, we don't have time for them, we don't care about them, but it's really the system putting that pressure on us. And if we don't do as we're told and hit these metrics, then we're fired or we're sanctioned or our contract's not renewed or we don't get our bonus. So once the physician, yeah. the one, you know, we, we're the ones that took all this time to go to medical school to uh, do the deep knowledge and understanding to learn how to best take care of people. We're the ones that should be in control of the system and we should be the ones to be able to do the right thing for people untethered. Um, and so patients yeah. will feel that. You know, I do hope that we are able to work with um, the government to make sure that we're able to take care of everybody as much, uh, you know, as well as we can within the current system. However, I do think that allowing the individual self-sovereign physician to decide on their own will encourage the, uh, the government and other health systems to come to the table and, um, you know, play ball in the way that we see as fair. Yeah. What are the, what are the, what are the barriers? So barriers to adopting blockchain or barriers to my, uh, to this, uh, you know, uh, organization yeah, being. Blockchain. So blockchain, yeah. you know, I, I did just recently give a presentation uh, in Cambridge about this. Uh, the barriers really lie in the people, <clears throat> whether they be individuals not wanting to understand or learn the technology, uh, the individuals not wanting to um, secure their own data, or the individuals that are in government or enterprise who don't want to share, who don't want to be, you know, enterprise doesn't want to be disrupted. Insurance doesn't want to be disrupted. Health systems are happy with the things, things the way they are because they're making, they're making money. Same thing with pharma, uh, pharmaceutical companies. Um, yep. You know, government, the barriers to adoption, it's not just the people, but, you know, there's well, whenever there's the physicians. We're, we're the same, yes. right? The, like I said, we put our heads down mm -hmm. and we're trying to take care of patients. And it's hard to think about why something like, you know, Bitcoin, right? When we think about this, about why that is important for what we're doing. And so right. I can imagine we're, we're, not the, we're not the fastest adopters. Right, exactly. Yeah. And so, you know, physicians have to, you know, wake up and realize just like with EMR, we didn't want it. We tried to avoid it. We didn't want to talk about it. When anybody wanted to work with us on how to build a system, we just said, we don't like those systems. We're going to use our own paper charts. And now look what's happened. Medicare and Medicaid is, are going to cut our funding if we don't impl Im implement it. The systems that exist are horrible. They're not user-friendly. They're clunky. Yeah. We don't find them useful at all. They don't, they're just data capturing um, you know, mechanisms for industry to continue to you know, commoditize on our data and our patients' data. And the reason that happened is because we were resistant. So, you know, this is an opportunity for us to wake up and stop being resistant and start considering the possibility that we could, if we wanted to, take a step forward and be um, on the front lines of applying a new technology to revolutionize this industry. Yeah, I mean, it's with everything else. It's like right now... I think all of us, whether we're talking about blockchain, we're talking about healthcare, we're either talking about politics, we're talking about your community, like now is the time that we need to start being proactive. Yes. Right? Instead of sitting back and like waiting for someone else to do the job. I mean, we as physicians especially, but also patients, I think, in, in terms of healthcare, we're we're always just sort of like we're doing our job. The physicians are the physicians are sort of like waiting for things to happen and going on the way that it's always been and things have been taken away from us. Um, the patients are waiting for someone to take care of them, right? right? And in the meantime, 
you know, everyone's arguing in Washington about God knows what that has to do with healthcare. And like, in order to be able to move forward, like we really have to be proactive. And it's really exciting to talk to you about stuff like this. There's people in the telehealth sphere that are doing things that are really exciting with stuff like this too. And I, I guess the big barrier that I feel, you know, besides, you know, this national legislature issue is if we could get rid of having to have state licenses yes. and that I can use my, you know, Holist has a telehealth platform. I can take care of people all over the place yes. with lifestyle medicine or urgent care, whatever I want it to do. Um, a lot of people could, we have this, you know, bit, we have something like HPEC that's helping us do, you know, the um, using this technology to be able to carry our own selves and not have to be identified with big systems or government. That would be, outstanding but like how do we move forward with getting rid of the licensure issue or how do we get around the issue that like you know we get can get uh, um accused of unionizing right. right if we god forbid you know we sit in a room together and have a conversation about how to improve our own profession you know right so um <clears throat> there's a couple of things i want to talk about regards to this so there's a lot of people that want to try to work within the system to fix the system and I have experience in lobbying. I have experience in public policy. And the fact of the matter is, is we as physicians are out money and we're outnumbered by special interests. So working within the system might provide some benefit, but it will unlikely provide benefit. Um, the legislative process is too laborious. It's very antiquated. It's extremely slow. Um, so part of the reason I know that this is a solution um, is that if we are all in one place, um, where we still have freedom and uh, mm -hmm. our sovereign rights to be who we are and to um, protect our professional brand and not tether ourselves to any system. Um, you know, HPAC and the Doctors DAO is a tool for physicians. It's not an or you know, it's not an organization. Um, it's not a group. Yeah. It's a tool for the self-sovereign physician to do as they need to do, um, while also having the power of the collective physician consensus behind it. So as far as the licensing thing, you know, I think that if all physicians or a significant portion of physicians get in one place and we demand it um, and we create a system for that to be easy and streamlined because we have this right. secure, immutable ledger of our credentials readily available to the states um, and we work with them to make everybody feel happy and safe with that plan. And it helps improve access to care for their patients. And we make it clear to the mm -hmm. public that that's what's happening, that this will increase access to care. Um, then how mm -hmm. are they going to say no to us? Um, but if we're not in one place and we just continue to try to do what we're doing in our you know, national regional medical associations or our, our small groups, then uh, there'll be no way to organize that idea and, get, and implement yeah. it. It's one of the powerful things about social media that I've kind of discovered this year in my venture into being um, more vulnerable and yeah <laughs> and, and more out there is that um, is that this you know is an, an absolutely um, a outstanding opportunity for us not just to meet each other and figure out how to how to have these conversations or how to introduce ourselves to our patient communities that we're real people and we care about the same things that they do and we're stuck in the same goddamn system as they are. Yes. Um, it's, it's the opportunity to start to figure out like, I, you know, I didn't, how would I know that someone in New York was doing this? Right. How do we get in the same place? Right. Yes. You can get in the same place virtually. Right. Right. Um, and you know, the, the whole thing you mentioned about unions, it's not against the law for doctors to unionize. Um, I spoke to some antitrust attorneys about this before I went into it. And the fact of the matter is, is we can get together, we can talk, we can unionize, but we can't strike and we can't price fix. We can't collude to price fix. And that's not what we're doing. Um, so yeah. there's, there's, there's no risk of us being in trouble for that on this platform. Um, however, the platform prevents um, this from being shut down by special interests because of the technology itself. You know, right. back in the yeah. 90s, there was an organization called MDNY. Uh, it was like 100, 150 doctors that all got together and tried to build a New York State Physicians Union. And they each put in like, I think, $6,000 or something like that. And what ended up happening is they weren't doing anything illegal. However, the doctors that were organizing it were sanctioned, were sued, and were tied up in litigation around antitrust issues. And they weren't able to work, they lost their homes, they lost their jobs. Did they do anything wrong? No. 
but it's like, you know, it's death by litigation, death by litigation, essentially. And I I know a lot of physicians who's that happened, that's happened to, you know, there was a doctor in California recently who was advocating for her patient and she ended up getting fired and ended up getting sued over it. Was she wrong? No, she came out ahead, but ended up with millions of dollars of legal fees. So, Mm -hmm. you know, these are the ways that they crush and silence um, opposition or, um, you know, uh, any kind of revolution. And that's why, well, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, I can even, even think about it just in, um, in terms of like contract negotiation, mm-hmm. right? So it sounds to me like you were a hospital employee. I work for a private group. And so we are constantly having contract negotiations with this insurance company, you know, 40 insurance companies just in Idaho, right? Or um, in our hospital system, right? For every hospital that we're working in. And those are really tentative, scary conversations to have because if you don't, if you ha- don't have the opportunity to walk away, and all forty of you lose your job, right, over something like that. Whereas if you own, you know, your own identity and your ability to, you, you can, ha- you have that much more power in terms of making. Um, making good decisions for yourself and your colleagues and your patients. So right, um, and portable yeah. credentials allows for that. If hospitals yeah. knew that doctors could very easily walk away, and as you mentioned, it would be great if it could be to over, across state lines if they needed to. Um, yeah. If we had easy ways to uh, work with patients via telehealth, and so we could find other ways to work and to make money, if we could, you know, then they would be less likely to strong arm us um, and put mafia contracts in front of us that basically we have we were forced to sign, you know. Yeah. Yeah, interesting. That's great. So um, give us a couple last pearls for us about things you want to know about you just about blockchain and, and healthcare, about what your grand vision is. Um, tell us a little bit about where, you know, our viewers can find you and follow you and support your organization and tell us, tell us a little bit more. Summarize so, for us. So first of all, I want everybody to understand that the most important thing to me right now is um, that you are interested and aware about what I'm doing. Um, I'd love for you all to go to my website, www.hpec.io. Um, and there you can sign up for the newsletter to stay informed. We're going to have an explainer video coming out. And so always the most important thing is information and, and awareness and awareness that this is already being built and implemented. Um, there are major organizations. I'm not going to name which ones, but you would know who I was talking about. Um, if I mention them, that are using blockchain technology to put our credentials on blockchain where they control it, and then they're going to work with health systems. And of course, as we said, we know where that's going. Um, And then there's also blockchain technology that's going to be used to poach the ICD-10 and, um, you know, CPT coding that we've been doing in, in our EHR. So that's our work, that's our attention, that's our time, that's our data. They're going to take it, put it on blockchain, and then commoditize on it. And so um, those are two examples of things that are actually being built right now. So this is coming with or without us. Uh, So uh, this is an opportunity to um, do it yourself with the physician community, the the tribe of people who, you know, went through the same process that you did. Um, Mm -hmm. So I'm also seeking um, investors, founding partners, who are interested in uh, helping me out with some funding and uh, they're going to have an equity partnership. Everybody is going to, my plan is for everybody to hopefully have an equity partnership, even members eventually. Uh, But the founding partners will have a significant stake and uh, they'll also have a stake in how this is built and how we design it because it it really will be built for us as a community. And it's really important to me that I I get feedback from the physician community and, and leaders in the industry. So those right. are two ways. It's like, it's like the EMR, right? It's like our electronic medical record. It didn't get built by us. It doesn't serve us. It doesn't serve our patients. And it's a bunch of shit, mm-hmm. right? But it's everywhere. Mm-hmm. And so if we are proactive and we design it ourselves, like it's going to be that much better. Who knows our system better than us and better than the patients, right? Nobody does. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's my whole point. We need to just step up and make that actualized in a digital space. Um, yeah. You know, and if you're a part of an organization... HPEC is a tool for your organization to also uh, organize the members around their interests. Um, You know, there's a lot of different organizations I've reached out to the founders and things who are considering coming on board uh, because it's a way for them to organize. Because as you grow, if you don't have any organizational way to keep everybody 
informed, um, and then things just become unscalable. So this is, yeah. this is very scalable in that sense too. Yeah. So, um, in the comments, when we're done, if you could hop in and put a link to your website, okay. um, I already linked kind of in the post to your Facebook or public Facebook group, um, so people or Facebook page. So people can join that, um, link to the website. Um, and there were two slides that I saw from your Cambridge talk that I absolutely loved the one that was like craziness with the patient way down here in the corner <laughs> and then your revision of it with the patient in the yeah. middle. Just kind of, if you could take like screenshots of that and drop them in the comments, I think people would really like that. And then any other, you know, references that you have besides to your website that you think, you know, explains this well um, would be great. I think just more information, the better. And, and obviously share, share this video around, use it however you want yeah. to try to explain things to people. And um, always happy to have you back on to talk more. Um, and, uh, you know, we're here at Holis, we're doing, um, you know, mostly lifestyle behavioral changes about, um, you know, food and self care and um, ways to prevent um, and reverse disease in ways that don't involve medicine and, um, and mostly doctors, right? It's all, <laughs> it's all things that you can do yourself. And I'd love um, to talk about that. that someday too, because I'm also doing the yeah. precision yeah. medicine thing. Yeah. So yes, that would be awesome. great. Yeah. yeah. And so we're, we're doing it all off the grid as well. Mm -hmm. Right. So, um, not, you know, all, it's all virtual. So, um, we have 12 week coaching programs that I'm setting up a kind of a virtual coordination care company for that. I love so it. If we could do that across the state, across the country, you know, without worrying about our medical license and calling ourselves coaches, you know, <laughs> that would be great. Yeah. So many, so, so yeah. many spaces for synergy. We just all have to get in one place. Yeah. So I really appreciate sure. you taking the time to, uh, let yeah. me, uh, talk about it. Absolutely. Right. Great. Well, it's great to see you. You have a great day. Oh, I too. just finished a night shift here in the, emergency medicine. So I'm going to gather up my things and go get my kids off to school and oh, wow. head into bed. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you.